Hi, everyone. I'm Cambridge Quantum Computing's Chief Business Officer, Denise Ruffner. Thank you for joining me on today's episode of Quantum Talks as we step into discussions about quantum computing, its history, and futures. Now let's kick off the series with CQC's founder and CEO, Ilyas Khan, and our head of quantum software, Ross Duncan. How did you get involved and what's your journey? been like? Give us a, a flavour for that. Your academic journey. And my PhD advisor was a guy who's called Samson Abramsky, who you may, may know. Yep. And he's worked a lot. At that time, he was mostly known for his work on game semantics. So he proposed me to work on game semantics. And I started working on that. And it transpired that my, my advisor, Samson, had a sideline in quantum computing, where he was hoping to apply some of the ideas from linear logic and from game semantics to this whole new topic, which had just started to open up in previous years. So we're talking about about 2001, 2002, quantum computing has gone from being a kind of fringe topic into something with real potential. Um, so then I spent a long time um, pursuing that direction, looking at connections between quantum computing and category theory and different kinds of logic. My, my work later with Bob Kuka who was also involved in, the, in that same group at the same time. We came up with the ZX calculus, which is a, a nicer way to talk about quantum systems than the usual language. And after, after being a lecturer in, in the University of Strathclyde for about five years, I decided it was time for a change. And then I came to work for CQC. You know, you're in a pub up in Glasgow and you're with a group of people. <laughs> and as people do, they tell each other what they do. And so they get round to you. And somebody says, well, Ross, what do you do? Oh, I usually just say I'm a mathematician and hope they don't ask any more questions. <laughs> so obviously I met you about uh, three, three years ago now. Yep. Um, at that time, CQC was already going concerned. So how did you get into the quantum computing business? That um, is a very easy question to answer. Um, I was at Cambridge and I had gotten involved with a group of people, including... Um, people at the maths department who were involved with Stephen Hawking, Professor Hawking. And I became chairman of what was then called the Stephen Hawking Foundation. And Ross, I was at the same time the co-founder of what is now a very successful program at Cambridge called the Accelerate Program, which was at the Judge Business School, where I at the time was um, a fellow. And it was a combination of those two things. The, the idea that you could start something that was, was British, that was different, and was sufficiently long forward-looking. Um, you probably remember this. 2013 was when Peter Knight and the United Kingdom got the UK te National Technologies programme going. Uh, what you might not remember is that Cambridge lost out. <laughs> so Cambridge didn't get one of the hubs. Um, so there was another sort of... Uh, prompt to that as well, which was to try and see whether we could create something that was a bit more commercial. I had no idea at the time that this would turn out the way it, it, it has, but it was really when you, Bob, Simone and Fernando got involved that this thing started to take shape because obviously the depth of knowledge required to actually do something rather than talk about doing it is what I've learned is the massive difference. Is there something that can be given as an example of something that a quantum computer ought to be able to do that a classical computer cannot? The Shor's algorithm, which is basically that quantum computers, once they work well enough and are large enough, should be able to break codes which classical computers currently can't do, or can do, but at the expense of such enormous effort that is probably not worth the bother of trying. So I like to talk more about the applications in the physical sciences. The fact that what quantum computers are really good for is simulations of things which are already dominant, already governed by the laws of quantum physics to begin with. So I'm thinking about um, molecules and materials. And so if we had quantum computers, they would really help a lot studying chemical processes like the reaction of, of gases in the ozone layer, how to do catalytic conversion, the design of new materials, and, and these kinds of things, new, new medications perhaps, to help scientists do their job better rather than helping uh, 
hackers do their job better. Are we at a stage, or how far are we away, do you think, from a quantum computer exhibiting all of the qualities that you've um, explained and spitting out a result that actually cannot be done classically? I would, I would have to uh, back the, the Google team here and say that it has already happened. The 53 qubit experiment that was published by the, the Google group, and I forget all the hundred authors of this paper, but um, it was a magnificent achievement. And okay, we, we can quibble about whether it was completely impossible to do this with a classical computer, but it's certainly right at the edge of what is possible. Mm -hmm. um, and for Google to take it well over that edge, they would only need to add like, one or two more qubits to their machine. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I would say we are at, at the brink Thanks for joining us this week on Quantum Talks. Next time, we'll take a deep dive into quantum products with CQC scientists. Please subscribe to our channel and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook to stay in tune with our latest quantum updates.